Good morning and welcome to worship. This recording is being made for Thursday the 17th and for Sunday the 20th of October. We're in the season of creation, four Sundays where we look at our responsibilities uh, as citizens and also custodians of the earth. And last week, Kim began the series by speaking about economy, God's economy, the way God expects all of us to live together, human beings, animals, creatures, uh, in, in relationship with him. And today I'm taking it further and looking at ecology and, and how particularly God wants us to live in symbiosis with the earth. So before the scripture reading is read for us, I want to remind you of a couple of notices. Firstly, today's uh, Sunday the 20th, there is Messy Church Goes Wild, a meeting at the beach, a life-saving station at the Strand Beach at 3.30 this afternoon. And Kim uh, will lead a group there, and you're very welcome to attend. You can turn up, but it needs to be before half past three. And then, in addition to that, I want to remind you that the Triple F Family Fun Fair Festival is being held on Saturday morning, the 26th of October, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. There are still some needs that we have. We need people to help us in stalls. We need donations. For the white elephant stall, the second-hand books, the jams and preserves, the puddings, the cakes, and so on. If you can assist, please, will you let us know in the church office. Phone Barbara or Stephen, if he is in the reception, you can also take messages. Uh, if you are able to sponsor ingredients, um, cooking oil, um, condiments, and so on, for our hot chips, our burro rolls, our hamburgers, we would really appreciate it. And then the final notice is that there will be a boiler room in the season of creation time. It will commence on the Monday after Triple F, that is the 28th of October, and it will end on Sunday, the 3rd of November, for that whole week of seven days. You'll see the sign-up sheets available, and uh, that boiler room is really an opportunity to interact in a prayerful manner with this beautiful season. Listen now to the scripture reading as it is read for us by Felicity Bamford from Leviticus 25. Greetings to you all. We're reading this morning from Leviticus chapter 25 and we're reading verses 1 to 7 about the Sabbath year. The Lord said to Moses at Mount Sinai, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land I'm going to give you, the land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years, sow your fields, and for six years, prune your vineyards and gather their crops. But in the seventh year, the land is to have a year of Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. Do not sow your fields, or prune your vineyards. Do not reap what grows of itself, or harvest the grapes of your untended vines. The land is to have a year of rest. Whatever the land yields during that Sabbath year will be for you, for yourself, your male and female servants, and the hired worker and temporary resident who live among you as well as for your livestock and the wild animals in your land, whatever the land produces in that year may be eaten. May the Lord bless this reading to our hearts and to our understandings. If birds could write books, then their story of creation would do, no doubt, read quite differently from ours. This is what Barbara Brown Taylor writes in one of her sermons. In the first place, I expect they would make quite a lot out of the wind that swept over the face of the waters in the beginning of creation. When human beings read wind, we feel it on our faces, pushing our hair around, and maybe even our bodies. pushing. Uh, not, but not many of us have a clue what it is like not to feel the wind because you're in it moving at the same speed, in the same direction. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, 
but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit, writes John in chapter 3 and verse 8. Birds love that verse. Sea creatures would probably still arrive on day 5 in the bird book of creation. Pelicans would insist on that. Plus, it makes sense to work your way up from the depths of the sea to the vaults of the heavens, filling creation with creatures as you draw nearer and nearer to God. On that ladder, land creatures would come next. Mice, chipmunks, goats, humans, camels, things like that. Earthbound creatures that could not get off the ground for more than a second or two without coming back down again hard on all those feet. Flying squirrels were pretty advanced. Mountain goats, so-so. But people, well... It was really kind of pitiful watching them try to jump off rock, flapping their arms. Sometimes when they slept, you could see their limbs twitching, as if they were dreaming of flight. None of this was their fault, of course. Bird mothers taught their children never to make fun of land creatures. God made them that way, the mother said, the same way God made you. Now go outside and fly. But day six, that was the day that everyone got excited about when the book of creation was read in bird church. The day God created birds in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Sparrows, ravens, wood ducks, and hoopoos. Whooping cranes, turtle doves, mockingbirds, and indigo buntings, all of them. Different, and yet all of them alike with two eyes, one beak, and those two marvellous wings, their daily assurance that they were made in the image and likeness of their Creator. This was not just God's gift to them, but it was also God's call to look after the sea creatures and the land animals as God would look after them, especially the people who seemed, in particular, need of help. Humans knew about God's wings, at least. They were not entirely insensible, to the order of creation. Sometimes when they read from their own book, you could hear this wisdom of theirs as clear as a bell. Guard me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. They read from the book of Psalms, chapter 17 and verse 8. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until the destroying storms pass by. Psalm 57 and verse 1. And who could forget how precious is your steadfast love, O God? All people take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Psalm 36 and verse 7. Who could read such passages without understanding that God was a, the bird, the great bird, who made everything that was and called it good? But who had loved birds so much? that God gave them wings. So, of course, the birds were glad to do what they could, waking people up in the morning with their sweet songs, thrilling human ch children with their acrobatics, and pretending to be the gummy white bread, to print, pretending to like the gummy white bread the children fed them down by the lake. Sometimes, under special order from God, the birds made bread deliveries of their own to humans in the wilderness. A few of them even volunteered to become food themselves when a whole crowd of people wandering around the desert said they were dying of hunger. The quail gave their lives to feed them. But really, what else are you going to do when you're the only creatures in all of creation made in the image of God? You love as God loves, right? You love what God loves, because that is what your life is for. I cannot tell you how many times I read the first chapter of Genesis, Barbara Brown Taylor writes, before I noticed something new on day six. Here, all this time, I had thought that we humans had day six all to ourselves. You know, the pinnacle of the story, God's last best word in the utterance of creation. With all the lesser creatures out of the way, the sixth day finally arrived. God ordered a kettle drum roll cleared his divine throat and said, Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Yes, yes, here we are at last. 
and let them have dominion. Oh, yes. And do not let them have that. I've always wanted dominion. Over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the wild animals, and over everything that creeps upon the earth, over the whole ranch, as far as the eye can see. This really is a wonderful book, don't you think? But then about six months ago, I noticed for the first time that day six does not start there. Day six starts two verses earlier with the creation of the land animals, cattle to be exact. The text does not mention any other animals by name except cattle twice, in fact, along with unspecified creeping things and wild animals. Now, all of a sudden, I do not have day six to myself anymore. I am sharing it with cows, which I do not have anything against except that they are such dim bulbs with such active salivary glands, since all they really do is eat grass. Couldn't God have started day six with snow leopards? What's wrong with antelopes? I understand how valuable cows were in the ancient world, like buffalo for Native Americans. One single animal that provided milk, meat, hide, and even dung for the fire. Cows are sacred in India, after all. Cows rank higher than most humans. And then there is the book of Jonah, with the best last line in the whole Bible. Quote, and should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between right, their right hand and their left hand, and also so many cattle. Still, it is a real come down, a reminder that while God may have made human beings for a special purpose, we were not made for any special stuff than the rest of creation. We were made on the same day as cows and the creeping things and the wild. Well, I think that's such a lovely story to remind us that we're not quite as fancy, as particular, as special as we think we are. We are a creature. While made in the image and likeness of God, we rank on the same level as all creatures. Genesis 2 is a second go at the creation story. Is verse 4 the conclusion of the account of chapter 1, or is it the first line of creation in chapter 2? I've always wondered. There are no shrubs, no plants, no rain, and no one to work the land when this story opens. The first humans come on the scene in Genesis 2, and they're made of earth, of dust, of mud, of sand, and God's own breath. The American preacher, Rob Bell, drew a comparison between the creation of human beings in Genesis 2 and the alternative Pentecost story contained in John chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. John writes, on the, first, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. You forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. And if you do not forgive, they are not forgiven. God breathed life into the first humans and continues to breathe life even into the first believers. But then Rob Bell goes on to refer to Psalm 104 with this breath thing. He says, God, when you hide your face, this is the psalmist writing, they are terrified. When you take their breath away, they die and return to the dust. And when you send your spirit, they are created. And you renew the face of the earth. So the breath of God, the life-giving breath of God, is there in creation, and again there when God recreates us for his spirit. So Bell takes it one step further. He says when he listens to the name of God being said in Hebrew, Yahweh, or Yod Ha Ve Ha, which is the consonants, it sounds like the sound of breathing. So maybe God's name is the same as the sound of breathing. And every time we breathe, we say God's name. 
So from a baby's first cry to a dying person's last breath, we say God's name. The Genesis story shows that a garden was created in Eden, in the east. There were trees in that garden, all kinds of trees for shade and fruit. There were also two out of the ordinary trees, the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that story is a story for another day. But the garden was set somewhere before, between four rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, which are still there, the Gihon, which could be the Nile, and a certain river called Pishon. And in this garden, a pattern of life was created that was supposed to be the pattern of life for time. The human beings were expected to work the garden. They were free, but their freedom had limits. They were commanded not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But like a plug socket held um, an allure for toddlers, and we had to put plastic in it to keep them from sticking their fingers inside, so our desire was for just that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then there's this notion of God's image and likeness. I've often wondered about that idea expressed in Genesis 2. What is God's image? What is God's likeness? And what part of us reflects God's image and likeness? We seem so different from God, especially as sin has changed us. God desired that we live in community and in harmony. Maybe as the Trinity is a harmonious, harmonious community. Maybe whenever we cleave to one another, husbands and wives in marriage, parents and children in the family and friendship, and even as brothers and sisters in Christ in the church, maybe that community is the image and likeness of God in us. When the woman was created, the Hebrew ezer, E-Z-E-R, was used. That was the word. And contrary to practice, it has no illusion of subordination. God is referred to even as an Ezer in Psalm 54. Significant is that we were innocent and felt no shame. Now the neighbor, of course, becomes an interesting and an important character in the Genesis story. In the parable Jesus told in Luke 10, the neighbor is the Samaritan, the most unlikely of the possible characters in the story. Not the priest nor the Levite, but the Samaritan, a half-breed, a discriminated against race, an object of scorn, becomes the neighbor. I was fascinated to read uh, one time a story about that came out of the Associated Press. It was announced that the recipient of an annual Vita Wireless Samaritan Award had been given that year to a 17-pound beagle dog called Bell. She was the first canine recipient of the award given to those who can use a cell phone to save a life, to prevent a crime, or to help in emergencies. When Bell's owner, Kevin Weaver, suffered a diabetic seizure last year, Bell saved his life by biting the nine on his cell phone to dial 911, just as she had been trained to do. She seems to have figured out all by herself, though, how to sense that his blood sugar was low by licking his nose. If she sensed that anything in his blood sugar was out of kilter, she poured and whined at him to do something. And every time she pours at me, he said, I grab my meter and I test myself. She has never been wrong. So might creatures, pets, animals, nature itself be a neighbor to us? Should we not live in symbiosis with that neighbor, should we not love that neighbor as we already love ourselves? In this economy, there is one sun in heaven that shines on everyone and everything. No matter what genus or species they are, no matter how much saliva they produce, no matter how much they've done or left undone, they all get sun. In the same way, when the rain comes down, everyone and everything gets refreshed. Those who deserve it, right along with those who don't. That's just the way God is with God's creatures, writes Barbara Brown Taylor. We are here because God made us. And if God made us, we live by love. Sure, some of us have give God headaches and others break God's heart. But we 
we don't get to make distinctions. Unlike cows, we are here to preside over the dominion of love. Made in the divine image, we are here to love as God loves, to be perfect as our Father is perfect. Therefore, we should love the world. And so I want to end this reflection by encouraging you to get yourself involved in any opportunity, frivolous as it may seem, to love our neighbor, the earth. It is our home. And often we have seen people in distress, people in protest, destroying the homes around them, burning down schools, destroying infrastructure. And I'm afraid that's exactly what you and I have done through generations. Our parents before us, and even in our generation now, we take very little interest in looking after the earth, in treating the earth as a neighbor. Perhaps we should consider doing that more than we have. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, what have we done with the earth around us? Even in the human heart, the microplastics have been found. The earth is full of pollution, the oceans too. We live as if only for today and not to leave a legacy for our children. Help us to invest ourselves in the things of God, to protect our home, our God-given home. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it including ourselves. Help us to spend ourselves in looking after each other and looking after our home. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, one who set us free.